The Bitcoin Group, the American original, for over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Derek J. Freeman from Peace News Now, Peace Propagandist. Hey, how's it going, y'all? Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Good to be here with everyone. And I'm Thomas Hunt from Mad Bitcoins. Issue one, DISH Networks to Accept Bitcoin. You can now buy your satellite television with Bitcoin, your Move Direct TV, recently acquired by AT&T. Your competitor, DISH Networks, now accepts Bitcoin. What's next? AT&T itself? How close are we to paying all of our bills with Bitcoin? Derek J. Pretty darn close. Thanks to apps like Gift, people are already paying a lot of their bills and expenses with Bitcoin. And uh, AT&T is sure to be next in line soon, uh, given this next development. I thought what was best and most interesting about this story from ABC, quote, Dish's chief operating officer, Bernie Hahn, says the idea came from company employees who had become avid Bitcoin users. I expect that to be the trend uh, as Bitcoin adoption takes off in the next year. Absolutely. Christoph Atlas. Well, I think we will see more and more companies accepting Bitcoin payments uh, with uh, payment processors like Bit BitPay and Coinbase. It's really quite a no-brainer. Um, I'm kind of staggered that more businesses are not taking that option at this point because there's it's just no risk. It's just cutting out some of the the credit card fees that you have, especially for the small businesses where it's like a half hour out of their day. It doesn't really cost them anything for the owner to set this up. Um, and a lot of these businesses they already have tablets. So they're just they don't that they're not aware of it yet. It's an efficiency uh, that's not on their minds. I do wonder like you know, how many people that use Bitcoin have TV dishes? I don't know. I haven't watched TV in years at this point. Um, I watched the Doge car race uh, on some kind of, you know, stream that someone set up illegally. And that was the last time I watched the Fox channel in years as well. So, like, I wonder if some of these larger businesses, like, they put a lot of effort into accepting Bitcoin. And I wonder how many Bitcoin customers they have. But that being said, they will still have that kind of first mover advantage that when the, when the next wave of adoption comes along, they'll already be poised to accept Bitcoin and, and take advantage of that. And when everyone's paying their bills in Bitcoin, they'll already be ready. We're just looking at the first, and you're absolutely right. People haven't heard of it yet. They don't know that it could take 30 minutes for their business to set it up, to have it on the tablet. You type in what the amount is. It makes a QR code that's like a barcode. They scan it, and they pay. That's all you really need to know if you're a business. Exit question. What's the next big company to accept Bitcoin? Try to think outside the box and name a company or category that has never been named with Bitcoin before. Derek J. Netflix. They're an innovative company. They've got high-tech users. Uh, they already make payments very easy. This could just be the next step. Uh, Netflix has done interesting things with changing the market and, and trying new things. Like when they uh, started going to full episodes or full series uh, right at the forefront, I mean, that, that was revolutionary. Bitcoin could be the next step for them. Absolutely. Christoph Atlas. I have two uh, categories in mind. Um, one is some of these smaller uh, cell phone companies that are, are trying to challenge the larger companies uh, like AT&T. I'm actually, with my personal cell phone, I'm sick and tired of AT&T AT you know, charging me a, an arm and a leg every month, and I'm planning on switching to one of these smaller services that kind of, you know, they, you know, it's it's, it's much cheaper. They piggyback off of the the infrastructure set up by Sprint and whatnot. So I think that they would be a good fit. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is um, like tax preparation software, like Intuit, uh, with their TurboTax software. I think that could be a pretty good match. 
um, they already need to do some work to get their software more friendly to you know calculating capital gains tax on cryptocurrencies. And so, if they can get that move in, then uh, you know the next the next natural progression would be to accept them as well to uh, you know again lower their credit card fees. That would be a great selling point for next year. Pay your taxes in Bitcoin with Intuit. I could see them going for that right there. And you're right, Derek. Monthly services like Netflix, uh, paying our cell phone business, anything that you're going to pay monthly, you should just pay with Bitcoin because you could just set a recurring payment from your account. Moving on, issue two. New video game comes with built-in Bitcoin miner. Too bad it's not the programmers who put it there. It's the pirates. Clever Bitcoin or clever pirates have included a Bitcoin miner in downloaded copies of the new video game Watch Dogs, which incidentally is about hacking the city of Chicago. Sounds cool. Is this the future of software, the future of computer security, or the future of video games? Christoph Atlas. Um, at the moment, I don't really see video games, you know, because people have proposed for a while, uh, maybe one of the ways that people could pay for video games is to kind of rent out their computer to the company to mine whatever. In the meantime, I don't really see that happening with Bitcoin per se right now because it's it's not very good at, you know, doing GP, GPU mining. It's so far behind these ASICs. I'm, I'm confused by the, the malware <laughs> programmer's choice to... Um, to choose Bitcoin, I guess maybe it's just a proof of concept for him or her. But um, yeah, so maybe another cryptocurrency that's more GPU mineable, uh, that could be a possibility because they're always trying to come out with these new models for video games. Uh, you know, they you know, the free free to play with um, you know little trinkets and stuff that you buy in the game, uh, subscriptions. You know, they're just they're they're kind of doing this, this scattershot approach, trying to figure out what's going to work for uh, gamers in the coming years. And so that's yeah, a possibility. It's, I don't think it will happen with Bitcoin, but maybe some other some other coin. As far as the malware goes, um, I think we absolutely are going to see more and more malware targeting cryptocurrencies. The more prevalent that the use of cryptocurrency is, it just makes computers such a, a, a hugely desirable target for malware. Um, if I was you know authoring malware myself right now, uh, that's absolutely what I would target right now. I'd do two things. One, I would try to uh, try any wallet files, and two, I would you know use the the CPU and the GPU to uh, mine some cryptocurrency. So I absolutely do anticipate that that will be um, a big boom for malware producers in the future. I do think a built-in miner might not be a bad idea. I know a lot of people support Dogecoin. Maybe if you were playing a certain video game, you'd be mining Dogecoin at the same time. It could even show you your stats in the game, make it a part of the game. You get a certain level of mining, you'd get some kind of reward, a new weapon. I mean, I think this is not a bad idea, although if you're using the graphics card to mine, you're slowing down the ability to do graphics for the game. So that is a bit of a trade-off. It has to be some kind of non-graphically intensive game, like a Dogecoin Pong. Derek, what do you think? Well, yeah, this absolutely seems to be the future of software. If it can be done, it will be done. And we see if there's someone who can benefit from it, like these uh, um, hackers who have programmed the Bitcoin miners into these uh, video games, yeah, th it's going to be done. But it's, I say it's the future of software because no consumer would be interested in buying software uh, that's riddled with this sort, sort of mining software unless they were benefiting as well. So I think it would be like what you described, Thomas, where they say, look, you're mining some Dogecoin, and then you get to keep those Dogecoin. Like, you get to keep what you're producing. It would only make sense uh, to use some of your computer's energy to produce something like that uh, and reward the consumer. It, it, something that can't be avoided, like 20 years ago, maybe pop-ups existed, but how many people knew the term? Uh, today everyone knows what a pop-up is and how to take care of them. Well, it just is, just as pop-ups are ubiquitous today, uh, I think that these types of miners will be ubiquitous in software. We could even expand on the, the idea the currency that you could be mining could be in-game currency like Duke Nukem credits. And the only people mining the currency would be the people playing the game. You'd have to play to mine. They could tie it in, some kind of reward system. But I definitely think there's a lot of ideas for... Uh, new cryptocurrency games and ways to integrate the two. 
So one of the the new trends too is this uh, internet of everything kind of idea where you know everything has its own IP address, it has its own little processor and stuff like that. So I just can't wait for my refrigerator and my toaster and my coat to all be infected with malware that are uh, mining for someone else. That that's that's that will be fantastic. They Ooh, my coat, my coat is a little toasty. It must be infected with some mining malware. <laughs> they recently announced they're going to put ads on my thermostat. I can't wait. Every time I walk down the hallway now, it pops on with this little light, and I'm like, wow, someday there'll be an ad there. What a great world. But hopefully they can all be mining a little bit of Bitcoin, too, and it'll all add up, hopefully. Exit question. If you could be paid in Bitcoin to play a video game, what video game would it be? Christoph Atlas. Um, let's see, I have almost no time to play video games, but um, I heard that, so this video game that we were talking about, the, where the, the torrent was infected with malware, um, I actually heard that's pretty cool, it's like a hacking themed game, so I'd be, I'd be interested in that, and uh, also Blizzard is coming out with their own like le- le- uh, League of Legends kind of competitor, that looks pretty sweet too, um, that's more like casual to play, so I'm actually looking forward to the release of that because that might be something I can play a little bit here and there. Nice. Derek J. Uh, I'm like classic arcade nerd style, so I would go House of the Dead 2, maybe the Simpsons arcade game, or Kaizo Mario, if any super nerds are out there who are familiar with uh, some of the extra levels of Mario. Very good. I'd probably go with uh, Pinball on the iOS, uh, Pinball Arcade's pretty good. Also, uh, Trism, great triangle game, but a bit of a puzzler. But moving on, the new report from Fox Business. Issue 3, Willie Report claims that bots manipulated the price of Bitcoin on Mt. Gox. Two bots, Willie and Marcus, with a K, were apparently making transactions without paying fees and using region-free accounts. Very suspicious. The latter bot even shared a database ID with Magical Tux, the alias of Mark Carpellis, CEO of Mt. Gox, lover of cats. Was massive price manipulation going on inside Mt. Gox? Derek J. It seems that way to me. I hate to be honest about it, but yeah, that's that's how it looks. I, I wish there were some little gem of, of hope, maybe. Maybe Kristoff can identify one, but uh, this looks to me like some sloppy uh, criminal work. Kristoff, Atlas. Um, hmm, I'm of two minds about this. Certainly it seems to be, it would be consistent with Mark Capelli's behavior in terms of just thinking like he can get away with absolutely anything. Like, oh yeah, we're, our, customers, our, our customers are totally getting shafted here. Let's open up a new Bitcoin cafe and I'll buy some shit with their Bitcoins. You know, that kind of stuff. So why not do some insider trading? Um, I was really impressed by the forensic analysis that the people did to write this report and uh, that they were actually noticing this kind of pattern of behavior based on the order books a while ago. That I thought that was quite interesting. Um, just another little niche of forensic analysis um, that will be possible through cryptocurrencies. This was largely due, uh, possible due to the, the data leak that happened with Mt. Gox's orders, but um, you know, I think it's just a whole new field that's going to be quite interesting for people to pick up casually. So the, the counter evidence would be like two things. One, uh, I saw that someone posted kind of a chart comparing, um, looking at the prices on BTC China versus Mt. Gox, and they were showing that um, a lot of the the legs up in the price were actually starting in BTC China before they happened in Mt. Gox. So if it indeed it was someone uh, manipulating the markets with these bots, it probably they would have had to somehow involve BTC China as well and be trading on that platform simultaneously. I don't know, it's, it's, it's uh, all a little bit over my head, but that's, that's one counter piece of evidence. The other possibility here too is that these are simply, um, these bots were being used by Mt. Gox to perform some dark pool trading. Dark pools are this idea of like, 
You know, there are people that uh, just buy uh, huge amounts of Bitcoin uh, at once, and if they just do it through the normal exchange mechanisms, then they manipulate the price a whole bunch. In fact, they can make it more expensive for themselves because if you try to, if you suddenly increase the demand for Bitcoin a whole bunch, then the market adjusts, it gets more expensive, and so before you even can fill your your entire order, your the Bitcoins at the, towards the end are even more expensive than when you started out. So there's the idea of these ideas that are very common on different markets. Uh, called dark pools where larger investors are able to trade uh, kind of off the books uh, with each other and it's, it's actually you know arguably a positive thing for the market to not just be moved uh, by these big whales so it's possible that um, the reason why we weren't seeing dollars backing up those particular purchases from the Willie report were to do with these dark pools or some other kind of hacked hacked together mechanism that um, Mt. Gox was using. Their entire operation was held together with you know duct duct tape and rubber bands, and so to have something inexplicable and and weird going on in the background with with regards to their trading platform that wouldn't shock me at all. And of course, they can't really respond to it now because they're embroiled in all of these lawsuits. So it's literally illegal, or at least. Um, really not in their best interest to put out specific information about this stuff quite yet. So we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. But kudos to the people that worked on the report. And remember that this was all reported on live by the Bitcoin report on the thebitcoinchannel.com. He noticed these trading irregularities as they were happening, and he made a video about it. That's good work. We're joined by Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Will, what do you think about the Willie report? and the news that bots may have manipulated the Bitcoin price on Mt. Gox. Yeah, it's, um, it's cool to finally have a, a close-up view. I mean, as Christoph said, kudos to the author of that report. Um, awesome investigation there. It was, a th it was like a riveting read. I couldn't uh, take my eyes off it. I had to kind of pause and think after sections and really just like, you know, this stuff we watch so closely, um, we only see, you know, as much as a layperson watching intently, you know, the, the charts can see. So, um, you know, digging a little deeper is fascinating. You know, I, I don't know, when the price of um, the Mt. Gox Bitcoin price became uncoupled so much from the other exchanges, either a hundred plus dollars higher or several hundred dollars lower, uh, you know, it's clear there was total shenanigans going on behind the scenes, and and those of us who were aware of all these withdrawal delays and and outright halts um, throughout the winter and the late fall um, of last year had a good sense that there was lots of nonsense going on there. Um, yeah, so it's it boggles the mind how whoever's behind that thinks they can get away with it when it's so transparent. And it's just like the mortgage scandal. There are just massive criminal activities going on, masquerading as financial activities, and no one seems to believe that the music will ever stop. But it will stop, and there won't be enough chairs. Exit question. Did they allow cats in jail? Maybe Mark can finally fulfill his dream to work in a cafe. Brainstorming. Can you imagine anything worse that could have happened at Mount Gox? Derek J. Still muted. No, I can't imagine anything worse in the financial realm. Certainly there could have been other sorts of crimes involved uh, that, that would just make it more embarrassing for Mt. Gox. But really, they, they've done everything that I could expect to go wrong for, for a company and that's everything that would make them untrustworthy. So uh, they're, they're a perfect example of what not to do, and uh, I hope that the, the Mount Gox days are well past us. A lesson for business schools everywhere. Christoph Atlas. Yeah, um, I get the feeling that that whatever Mark has done, he's going to get away with. He probably will never be able to travel to the United States. He may be uh, you know, living in uh, the Bahamas or something like that in the near future, but... Um, so far, I'm not seeing this trending towards his um, being truly held accountable for this. Will Pangman. Yeah, I, I gotta have to echo Christoph there. I, I agree. I don't think he'll really face the, you know, true justice per se. But um, 
yeah, could anything have gone worse? I mean, even stepping out on the farthest out on the limb, if, if Mount Gox was in some way some kind of operation to um, gobble up fraudulently, fraudulently all these Bitcoins with 80% uh, market share of trading activity and then destroy them all somehow, you know, that would be pretty bad. But, again, as we've seen happen, you could reboot the thing the following day. It'd be better, you know, it'd probably have some improvements even and have a leg up um, in terms of starting ahead of where the original Bitcoin started five years ago. So uh, that would be maybe the slightly more worst case scenario, but, you know, it's, uh, it's nothing to be singing doom and gloom over. I think it's a great idea that even if they had intended to, they really couldn't have done any worse. It's almost impossible to think of ways that they could have done any worse. Did you know the Bitcoin group is being broadcast live on the World Crypto Network at worldcryptonetwork.com? If you are watching us live, you could make your own predictions and ask questions. Now is a good time to write them into the Google Hangout. Make your own prediction, ask a question, or make your own show and join us. The World Crypto Network wants you to get involved with Bitcoin any way you can at worldcryptonetwork.com. All right, enough plugs. Moving on. Issue four, choose your own topic. Good news, bad news, and more bad news. Spain-based CoinFiend to challenge centralized Bitcoin exchanges with a distributed alternative. Are decentralized exchanges the future of Bitcoin exchanges? Popular encryption tool, TrueCrypt, mysteriously shuts down. Encrypting your data with TrueCrypt, it might not be so safe. A cryptic message from the developers and one more sector of security falls, presumably to the NSA. Speaking of security, how about some anonymity? Darkcoin, which was all the rage last week, is all in a rage this week. With an emergency hard fork and network issues causing the price to go chaotic in the last few days. So now, Will Pengman, who just got here, we're looking at you. What will you choose? I think I'm going to go with the first topic, decentralized exchanges. Uh, yeah, we, we can't get to these soon enough, in my opinion. Um, as uh, While there's this ongoing debate about regulation and the appropriate rules or you know whether the Bitcoin business CEOs get to have input or a chance to write them themselves or not, um, I think before we come to a conclusion on those kinds of questions, we'll already have decentralized exchange and a lot of those debates will be rendered moot. And that's why I've always been so excited about Bitcoin it's because the pace of innovation far outdoes that of, um, you know, the, really the rest of uh, the old paradigm, I guess you should say. So um, there's always hope, you know, we'll have workarounds before there's a need for them, which is great. Like BitTorrent before it, the technology itself will answer the question. Derek J. CoinFeen is the story of this week, in my opinion. I, I'm looking for decentralized exchanges always, and I know there are a few that are out there already, and I just want one that's easy. Like, I use... Um, local bitcoins often to exchange bitcoins for cash in a regular in a geographic area. Um, that's not how most people. If if you're a trader, that's not the type of exchange you're going to use. To be that easy, to to be as easy to you know, you go to a website. You don't need to fill in all kinds of info. You can pump in some bitcoin. You can pump out some whatever sort of things you want, uh, USD or euros. And it seems like CoinFeen is going to be the closest to that that I've seen of any exchanges. It says it uses, from the article at Coindesk.com, what's called a micropayment channel. And that was a new concept to me, so I feel like I should elaborate a little bit for other folks. It says, <clears throat> once the deposits have been set up, so like you deposit some uh, Bitcoin and then they deposit some like Litecoin or whatever you're exchanging to, and then there are a series of micropayments that go sort of back and forth um, instead of just one 
payment to uh, from one person to another, and that reduces the risk that uh, there's that one instant where you've been paid and the other person hasn't, and then you just cut out. So that's a that's a clever solution, and I, I look forward to seeing how it works. So, go CoinFeen. I want to see more. I do think it'll be Bitcoin to Dogecoin before you see Bitcoin to USD or to Euros. Unless they have perhaps a basket of virtual USD or virtual euros that they're passing around. Christoph, Atlas, we're leaving all the heavy security topics to you. Yeah, do I have to choose between uh, TrueCrypt and Darkcoin? You could do a little of both if you'd like. All right. They're both quick topics, honestly. So um, with Darkcoin, I just saw today there was like a little thread on the Darkcoin forums, and they said, currently the developers are testing on testnet went wrong to uh, try and reproduce the bad behavior of the master nodes that these were these master nodes that do the kind of coin join stuff that makes uh, dark send possible, and they were some of them were misbehaving when they did a hard fork, and they said the main network is stable, nothing to worry about, uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, there's nothing really too terrible going on with, with Darkcoin. It does lead you to... Um, compare, though, to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin had a hard fork issue about a year ago, and um, that was, that that was, again, due to, you know, there were some people running some version of the software and other, other people not running quite the same version. Their, their software wasn't behaving the same way. And so in terms of maturity, Darkcoin is at least, uh, based on this example, about a year behind Bitcoin. And usually when we talk about Darkcoin development, what we keep hearing about is Evan Duffield, who is like the main uh, Darkcoin programmer, but we don't really hear about anyone else. And to me, that's a little bit disconcerting. When I hear about a cryptocurrency, if I'm going to um, invest in them heavily or in, in a long term, I want to know that they have a team of people behind them. You know, if, if Evan get hit, gets hit by a boss or something, God forbid, um, what happens to Darkcoin at that point? At, at this point, it's not too clear that anything positive would happen to Darkcoin. It seems like a lot is riding on his shoulders, and so that's that's a little bit disconcerting. Uh, with the TrueCrypt stuff, I mean, as far as we can tell, TrueCrypt is fine. Um, my best guess on this story is that the TrueCrypt programmers have always been um, on the down low. They're, no one knows exactly who their identities are. And my guess is that, you know, they've been having some, um, they've been audited by some third parties in the last few months. And what they should be doing now is fixing TrueCrypt. And it seems that for whatever reason, they don't feel like doing more free work on TrueCrypt. And so my interpretation, my interpretation of the message that they put out was simply, hey, look, uh, there was just the audit done. They found vulnerabilities they should be fixed, but we don't want to fix them for whatever reason, and so consider TrueCrypt to be in a kind of incomplete state from that standpoint. Um, I d at this point, we don't. I don't think anyone has any reason to believe that they shouldn't use TrueCrypt at the moment. Uh, we may be corrected on that sometime soon, but uh, for the moment, that's that's where we sit with TrueCrypt. Very good. Thanks for the security update, Christoph. Moving on to questions and answers. The first question. From Dustin, how long until we see X11 ASICs? First off, uh, X11, does that refer to the dark coin algorithm that uses 11 different types of algorithms? Is that what it is, basically? Yeah, that's my so, understanding. I mean, I, it sounds 11 times more complicated than a script ASIC, so however long it took uh, to uh, create a script ASIC. So. I mean, I think the main pressure there will be market forces, so... Uh, the first ASICs for Bitcoin came out uh, sometime in 2013. I was trying to look this up, but I couldn't quite nail it down to a date. I guess Avalon, they said that they were the first to actually deliver them. So let's just say, like, early 2013, when the price was somewhere around, um, what was it, like, 20 bucks per Bitcoin or something like that? And there was maybe around, around it to, like, 10 million um, so that would have been a market cap of 200 million, if I calculate that correctly. So um, I would expect that we wouldn't really see ASICs until one of these, um, until the 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 uh, at least you have one cryptocurrency uh, that corresponds to that 
hashing algorithm hits that type of market cap, that's going to be around the time that companies say, okay, it's now worth it to us to make these these ASICs. I don't think it's ASIC proof. Um, it might be a bit more challenging than SHA-256, but I don't think that will necessarily stop people. We haven't even seen uh, like script ASICs really at this point, and so um, you know, I don't know that we should necessarily anticipate that it will come very soon for these other algorithms. Very good. So it sounds like a while. It should it should be a while. It sounds like a really complicated thing. The next question, uh, this is just a brief recap. Are decentralized exchanges being developed? Uh, yes. In Spain, they're developing them. They're calling them CoinFeen is the one right now. And I'm sure many other people in many other countries are working on the decentralized exchange idea. If you're a really good programmer, uh, give it a shot. We could use one. And again, I think the idea Bitcoin to Litecoin, Bitcoin to Dogecoin, these are going to be easier than Bitcoin to USD. And I think there's going to be a lot of decentralized exchanges competing in a marketplace. So let's see. They want us to do a little chartism. So I'm going to pull up the old chart here. Everyone should know BitcoinWisdom.com has some great charts if you're into the charts. Looks like they've changed their fonts or something. Wow, look at that. So we've got a heck of a tower going on right here. And we're moving on to the next question. We're going to talk about the price. Bear or bull on the 620 price zone? And first, as a quick recap for everyone watching the chart at home, there are reports of a 3,000 Bitcoin buy on Bitstamp. So it's pretty much to believe that this first candle here is the 3,000 Bitcoin buy. The rest of it is people reacting to the buy. Derek J., are you a bear or a bull? Still muted. <laughs> Thanks. I'm a, I'm a bull on Bitcoin, obviously, oh. uh, long term. In the short term, you know, whenever there's a huge rise like this, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, most people who have been investing for a while take some profits. So uh, in the short term, it'll probably go a little bit down, but long term, it's going up. Christoph, bear or bull? Well, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm really a big fan of Professor Bitcoin, and uh, he's predicted that it's going to hit $10 uh, within 30 days. So that's what I expect, of course. That would be an incredible drop. Will Pangman, bear or bull? Yeah, I think um, there's a, there's been a trend reversal here. Uh, as soon as it went beyond $500, we kind of saw, um, you know, a few tests, uh, and then it's just going to continue a steady climb. I think the certainty that arose out of the Willie report, you know, more certainty about what really happened at Mount Gox or that we're getting closer to the bottom of this, you know, conundrum here, this uh, Gregorian knot. And, yeah, so I think a lot of people will be reacting to that. I have trader friends that think that um, there's still a lot of people who overbought and are praying and holding and praying that they can get out with – maybe, you know, a 50% loss as opposed to, a, you know, a 70% loss or something. Um, so we might see more downward pressure from that, but I, I don't think there's that much of that, especially if we see a steady rise. Those people's minds may change, even though even if they're holding, a, you know, a six-, seven-month-long heavy bag of uh, losses, you know, maybe what's holding longer if you've held for six months or so already, you know, I think we're, um, we're seeing a slow crawl back past 1,000 and beyond and probably pass a thousand before the end of the year um, and yeah the summer is going to be a lot more active than this past summer was <laughs> I think Will's right I think we've seen the bottom and the next stop is the moon as Theo says in the comments prediction next week 695 bitstamp so he's going bullish we've got a new question from the cyborg.org he says does anyone have a commentary about Budweiser giving away Bitcoin to concert goers this summer? Do we know where? Ten bucks for concessions, I heard. This is the first I'm hearing of it. Sounds yeah. like a really great idea. Yeah, they got a they they got a partnership going. Oh gosh, I don't know why. I just uh, can't remember who. Maybe it's Coinbase. Coinbase is doing a lot of action. Got to flip a coin. It's usually Coinbase or Bitcoin. Yeah, they, I'm pretty sure Coinbase, and it's cool. So they're giving uh, ten dollars worth of Bitcoin. That'll be you know. Concessions and merchandise uh, will be sold in Bitcoin. I think tickets as well. Um, so 
that's really cool. I mean, there's these huge corporations that are just dipping their toes in the water now. You know, I didn't get I, I didn't get on the 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 show for the uh, the Dish Network topic, but I think the quick point about Dish Network and Budweiser is Bitcoin is increasing its surface area so much with just those two brands. I mean, just think about Dish Network, 27 billion market cap and a far greater number of users per se or customers than WordPress. Um, so. You know, that's huge. And, and Budweiser, I mean, just some of the iconography and the advertising at some of these events, I mean, concerts and, and, um, and uh, you know, entertainment events in general do a great job of branding, visual branding. And, again, this is just going to create these associations as a propagandist or a psychologist would suspect, you know, uh, or design. So this is great for, for Bitcoin, you know. Um, whether you think TV rots your brain or alcohol rots your brain, you know, and you're not going to partake, that's fine. I probably won't buy Dish service, but uh, yeah, I'd like to catch one of these concerts and get some bitcoins and and walk around singing the praises, you know. It sounds great. It sounds really excited, Derek J. What do you think? I, I this is the first time I'm hearing about it as well. Although I've heard of things like it in the past, where companies will give out Bitcoin or as a promotion and they'll say like well let's see what people do with it like I know MIT did that recently uh, MIT, different uh, Coinbase or uh, both have given out a lot of Bitcoin lately to students yeah and I think that's smart because you want to see what customers are going to do with it like Dish uh, just being like we're going to accept it that's great but then how many people are going to buy Dish with it is questionable. Well, this is an easy, inexpensive way to test the waters, and I'd like to see more companies doing this, saying like, well, what if we gave Bitcoin out to our customers? What would they do with it? Uh, I think they'd see a lot of people would be interested in spending it, <laughs> and uh, then they would be quick to adopt. I think it's a great idea to envision the always too long line at concerts for refreshments and seeing some pe people paying in Bitcoin quickly and just moving through the line and you know I know when I grow with, go with people in a group of Bitcoiners we always try to pay together and we just you know pay in the line bing 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 and like that would be pretty great and just demonstrating it to other people all over the country and it sounds like a really great and exciting idea so welcome aboard Budweiser like glad to hear about it yeah that's we've a great it's a great idea for any activists or people who want to do Bitcoin outreach you know maybe that's the mark you can make in the space and this is a great vehicle for that, you know, get a bunch of people uh, cost free except for getting into the venue and, and do your do your um, guerrilla marketing for Bitcoin. You get to see a concert too, great deal. It sounds all right. So we've got another prediction that it'll take at least a year before X11 ASICs if they come at all. We've got another question about the X11 ASICs, kind of a statement. He says, are script miners already obsolete since the trend moves over to X11 algorithm and Litecoin isn't doing much? It does seem like script is slowing down, but there's still a variety of coins that you can mine with a script miner. I think the move to X11 and other ASIC resistant coins is because of the script ASICs, which of course the script ASICs, the GPU cards, because of the Bitcoin ASICs, which are because of the Bitcoin and the GPU cards and the CPUs. So it all comes back to the beginning. You know, things are getting better, and the miners are getting better. So yeah, I don't think link. people are used to how quickly the innovation grows in that space. I mean, many of us aren't even used to how quickly the news cycle is in Bitcoin. You know, so with arguably mining uh, as an industry or the the manufacturer of the chips is the fastest innovated space in tech today, you know, which is, it's blinding speed. So um, the faster we can get to kind of, you know, some threshold here and see some more horizontal, um, more horizontal behavior, because right now we're seeing all these farms growing up and stuff, uh, the better. But I don't think, uh, I don't think the innovation hurts the decentralization as much as people think. We've got the link to the Budweiser article. It looks like it was on Coindesk a few days ago on the 21st of May. Um, people say, what is Litecoin doing? Well, Litecoin is staying around $10, $11 a coin. It wasn't going all crazy like Darkcoin. So everyone, all the traders kind of want a coin that's going all crazy. So James said that we could mine during off time to build credits to play the game later. That's a good idea. The game could actually be operated by Bitcoin tokens or credits. 
I heard another really good uh, video game related idea I wanted to put out there. The, uh, the little registration codes that they use to handle games, those could be stored in a blockchain. You could pay for them and you could keep your receipt for paying and your payment information in the same place that you keep your little registration code. There's no reason that this couldn't be merged together and in the future you'll never lose access to your game as long as you have access to your Bitcoin wallet. So, moving on, let's see what other questions. People say, yeah, a lot of people overbought in November and those are probably the same people that are tacking on a red candle right now. The rally lasted to 629 and is now being driven down to 615. We're having some sells going on. This is live Bitcoin charts. And it looks like we've just got a couple of predictions left from the audience. So I'm going to read the predictions that proof of chain will become the next altcoin trend. I don't know what proof of chain is, but there's that idea. It's out there now. And also, Theo also predicts that metal hats that use alpha brain waves to mine quark are the next big thing. And moving on to our own predictions or story of the week. Derek J, do you have a prediction or a story of the week? Yeah, I think one of the best stories this week uh, is Reading Rainbow is being revived with the help of the Dogecoin community. I was just the Dogecoin community is helping revive the popular show Reading Rainbow, starring LeVar Burton. Uh, I grew up listening to the stories told by LeVar, and it was hard. Uh, he is joining the 21st century, fundraising for his show to produce it ahead of time rather than trying to produce a show and then make money as it's um, produced. So this is great. Good job, Dogecoin community. I I'm excited to see what they'll do next. I mean, among other things that they've done in the past, like uh, feeding people, giving them clothes and shelter, this is not anything like that. Um, but they continue to do good things that make the world a better place. So this is my story of the week. That's a great, great story. Welcome back to Reading Rainbow. And I hadn't heard of the Dogecoin connection, so congratulations to the Dogecoin community. Reading Rainbow is a great show and deserves to be supported. Christoph, Atlas. Um, I'm starting to get excited for Bitcoin in the Beltway, which is going to be uh, June 20th through 20, the 22nd. Um, this is going to be in D.C. or in the belly of the beast, so to speak. Um, there's a pretty all-star all lineup of speakers, and then I'll be speaking as well. Um, and I actually just uh, I emailed Jason King, and I was like, I want to do a, a speech about Silk Road. Am I going to piss off your sponsors or... You know, they're going to storm the stage. And he was like, screw it, man, just go for it. So um, that's, uh, that's, I'm going to start working on that uh, presentation pretty soon. It should be pretty interesting. Very cool. Will Pangman. Yeah, I'll be at uh, Bitcoin in the Beltway, and I can't wait to see a presentation like that, Christoph. So that'll be a real pleasure. Um, my story of the week uh, is the launch of Tatiana Coin. Uh, for those who don't know, Tatiana Moroz is uh, an accomplished musician. She's toured the world, really. Uh, Singer-songwriter, beautiful voice, you know, great, so great uh, songwriter. And she's doing the first user-created asset for a musical artist or any artist to essentially crowdfund her, uh, her whole operation, you know, her art production. So tours and album production and, um, you know, paying for a backup band because she's usually a one-woman show, um, but she's, you know, got projects lined up with, uh, with a backup ba uh, backing band and um, a tour lined up. And one way or another, these things are going to happen. So check out TatianaCoin.com. Uh, she's a good friend of mine. And if you haven't heard her music, give her a listen. If you, if you like Bitcoin artists, she should be in your, in your rotation. Um, what are the what are the ones out there? Well, Zutong, of course, uh, who I heard is going to be performing live in DC. That's awesome. Anyway, um, I'm a big fan of his. And then YT is it? Um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Bitcoin YT Cracker. Bear. Yeah. yeah, that's a great song too. So like, there's great Bitcoin music artists out there who can benefit from uh, the trailblazing activity of Tatiana and anyone who wants to do like an IPO like this. I think Tatiana's really. Uh, going to be the first one kind of so for any of these kinds of assets so um, user created assets and hers is going to be focused for you know art production and crowdfunding artists work 
which, um, as we all know, much, is mu in much need of um, a new business model, let's say. So, uh, so that's really exciting. TatianaCoin.com, uh, follow at TatianaCoin on Twitter, and, you know, go check it out. Absolutely, Will. Tatiana Coin's a very cool idea. And if you can just imagine paying for your tickets in Tatiana Coin, going to the show, maybe buying a, C a CD or a T-shirt or something, autograph Tatiana Coin, just the way that it all works out for an artist, even a year later, maybe buying access to a download or an MP3. Having coins of an artist you like makes a lot of sense for the artist. So we'll I assume that, that um, when 50 Cent launches his coin, it will be called Half Coin? <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. I read a great article on uh, GQ about 50 Cent this week about him acting as someone's life coach. So if you haven't read it, check it out, even if you're not a 50 Cent fan. It's a fascinating piece. But we're going to almost end the show now with a prediction. Something big is happening in Bitcoin. 3,000 Bitcoins were recently bought on Bitstamp, causing the price to rise above $600 a coin. Somebody out there has taken notice of our handiwork. And I think they like it. I think they like it a lot. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye.